to do. It is now 10.01, so officially good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Geared Libraries and Growing Community Capacity to Connect You to the Outdoors. My name is Severia Tilden and I'm the Communications Manager for Transforming Youth Outdoors, also known as TYO. For those of you that are new to us, TYO is created to scale the impact in youth outdoor development and transform the lives of youth by providing best practices, tools, and support to individuals and organizations working with youth in the outdoors, such as yourselves. We are a free technology platform that enables those in the field of outdoor youth programming to learn, share, network, and build upon successes. Our webinar series is just one of the many ways that TYO connects you to experts and valuable learning opportunities. And it's something that we're very excited about and we're really excited for the different people who have been joining us. Membership uh, to TYO is free and you can sign up at mytyo.org. We like to let you guys know that because sometimes People join our webinars and they actually don't know what TYO is. So we would love to have you guys check us out. And let's get on to today's webinar. So today's webinar is a joint venture with the Outdoors Empowered Network, also known as OEN. Kyle McDonald will be sharing how the OEN program model is successfully getting gear into the hands of teachers, youth worker, and youth workers to engage their community and get them outdoors. But I will let you tell about more about yourself and OEN, Kyle. So take it, it's all you. Terrific. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to CIO and Severia for all your help in organizing all the technology. Uh, we thought we'd just start by giving you guys a chance to, to see me, that I'm a human behind uh, the computer and the organization. Um, give you a chance to uh, see me in case by any chance you're going to be in St. Paul for the Children and Nature Network conference uh, in a couple of weeks here. Um, please stop me. If if you're going to be there. Um, and just let you know I'm reporting to you live from San Francisco um, where the fall will begin to roll in for the summer pretty soon here um, and we're excited uh, to be sharing what we do uh, today. So thanks. Um, I'm going to turn my video camera off um, and we'll get going on the presentation. All right. Good to go, Severia? Yep, looks great. Okay. Well, thanks for joining, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today uh, about a number of things. Um, but before we actually begin on this, what I'd like to do is, is learn a little bit about you, um, share a little bit about myself. But Severia, can you go ahead and start with these polls? Just going to ask you guys a couple questions here so I can learn about where you come from. Severia? I think she's going to be taking herself off a of mute, I'm hoping. Hi, so I just launched the poll. Let me see. Let me see if it goes up. There we go. Oh, okay, cool. So we're going to give everyone just a few seconds here to go ahead and um, let us know how you would describe your organization. So you should be able to select that. Great. We'll give you guys about 15 more seconds here. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to close the poll. I'm going to share the results really quick. So that way we can see. Quick poll. Terrific. Yeah. Excellent. So, so actually, since, since about 40% since about of you are uh, listed as other, uh, um, maybe I can ask um, Severia if this will work for people in their chat. Um, to say what type of other organization you're a part of and then Severia can keep track of that um, for me because that'll help me to really tailor my conversation with you all. Absolutely. Can we do that, Severia? Yep, yeah, so go ahead and if you guys just want to put in the chat message um, for the others, what kind of organization. We also were curious about where you're joining us from. So I'm gonna go ahead and put up another poll. 
Um, and you can let us know where you're hailing from today. Okay, we've got everybody. Yep. Everybody come. Terrific. And then I'll just share that with everybody if you can see that. Cool. Great. Excellent. Every region accounted for. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Great. And then, um, Kyle, if you want to go back into Prezi mode, and I will hide. Yeah. Okay, there we go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. And then, as far as where other people are coming from, Kyle, um, so we have. Leave No Trace, YMCA, uh, Urban Land Trust Conservation Organization in Kansas City, um, Education Outreach Programs for Texas State Parks, uh, more YMCA, Outdoor Adventure Education Nonprofit. Yep, so that's, uh, and then... Um, let's see. Outdoor leaders launching a pilot program that will help community explore the possibility of using training in gear light, the gear light library model. So cool. Terrific. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Um, okay. So uh, this is what we're going to focus on, on our presentation today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about outdoors empowered network and how we got where we are today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the train and support program model. So this is really where gear libraries um, come in and how, we, how it is that we feel like we're building community capacity. I'm going to talk about two paths to the model. So there's a couple different ways in which it's being employed around the country uh, that we're involved in and we'll share that. And then if this feels like it's a model that you want to get going in your community, I'm going to talk a little bit about those first steps and how to get started. And then lastly, I'll try to leave about 20 to 25 minutes for discussion and Q&A. Um, so you can post those questions. Um, and again, Severia will be collecting those. And um, hopefully that can be a really interactive and, and informative way to um, make today productive. So, all right. So let's start off um, first with a little history, actually. Uh, so I want you to take yourselves back to 1968. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, this was a pretty tumultuous year, um, and uh, Martin Luther King was killed, lots going on um, socioeconomically, uh, it change, changes in the wind as they will, um, and in 1968, in that year in Boston, Massachusetts, some folks from the Appalachian Mountain Club, um, almost assuredly some white folks, went to, into a black community in Boston and said, hey, we'd love to take your kids outdoors. And uh, the black folks in that community said, no way, you're not taking them outdoors, but we'd love it if you teach us how to take them outdoors. And they said, that's a great idea. And thus began the Youth Opportunities Program, uh, where they began training teachers and youth workers how to take kids, just like these kids, outdoors. Fast forward to uh, 1993. And this is where I begin working for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And I had an interesting thing happen, kind of my aha moment. Um, actually, in, about, in and around about 1995, 96, uh, I was taking a group of kids um, from Philadelphia, an all black group of kids from Philadelphia on a trip. And everything that you want to have happen um, on an outdoor trip happens. Uh, it's really hard, but it's fantastic. It rains on us. And just transformation, right, is, is happening. Um, and it really feels to me, and I think to these kids, like this is, this is a special thing, right? So hugs at the end, um, I say guys, and I, 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 there's something that irks me, and I'm just like, you know, this is great, but I just am not going to know how this makes a change for them down the road. Like, are they gonna, ever going to be able to get back? You know, is it, is it going to really make a long-term difference? And, um, and I decided that after I learned about the Youth Opportunities Program, that that was really actually the better way to go about it, was to train teachers and youth workers. So I moved to San Francisco uh, from my teaching job. I was teaching at the time in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I founded Bay Area Wilderness Training in 1999. So this program 
uh, has become the largest member program of Outdoors Empowered Network uh, in the West and as to date served almost 50,000 youth. So uh, that's a again a little bit about my story and, and how we got uh, headed towards where we are. In 2012, I handed off that organization and I started Outdoors Empowered Network. So I started it with this question and the question was why is this model that works so well um, in Boston and throughout the Northeast and now out here in the Bay Area, why is it not in every city in the United States? So again, I started uh, this organization with the, to address that question. All right, so our mission then is to grow a powerful network of regional organizations that gets kids outdoors through outdoor leadership training and outdoor gear libraries. And that's what our presentation is going to be about a little, a little bit more today and the effect of, of that model. Okay, so where are we? We're in lots of cities throughout the United States. Uh, there's actually about eight programs that are employing this model in uh, approximately 20 cities throughout the U.S. Uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club uh, reaches more than just the three cities throughout the Northeast. They, ha again, have been doing this for over 50 years. Uh, and then the member programs in the, fall the other cities that you see uh, are make starting to make a big impact. 75% uh, of these programs um, those in the West especially uh, are new programs um, and so when you think about that and you think about the fact that in 2015 um, we had this type of impact uh, it's pretty exciting so we trained 318 teachers or youth workers uh, we reached over 10,000 youth through support uh, of 379 trips uh, and we distributed about $135,000 worth of equipment. Uh, that's one of the biggest and most important things we do for uh, our members is to help them to keep these gear libraries filled with the gear that helps to get the kids out on overnight trips. All right, so let's talk about the situation. This is a little bit about what we see. Uh, I thought I'd just do a little comic relief here. Um, many of you can relate to this. It's technologies is really one of the things that we're facing um, and it's just just one of the things that make up the situation that we're dealing with today. So um, if we start in the upper right hand corner here I wanted to describe this sort of a theory of change for us if you will. Um, the situation as we see it is that there's a growing gap between humans and our connection to nature. Uh, childhood has moved indoors, many of you know uh, that a few years ago uh, the world's population had moved to a place where more than 50% uh, of humans now live in cities. So we're really seeing this, this disconnect. So on top of that there's this complication and that's that the barriers to the outdoors are increasing and systemic. So in addition to having to compete with technology there's lots of fear about the outdoors. Uh, there's institutional racism which has made it hard for many communities to get in the outdoors um, when there isn't sleeping bags and tents and other forms of gear, the right clothing, it's harder to get outdoors uh, and you're certainly not going to go camping if you don't have sleeping bags. Transportation is an issue, um, money to buy food and permits, all the rest. Um, I know you guys know many, uh, many of these issues already and are, are working to address them in your communities. So we think about that situation, we think about the complication, and then we ask ourselves, how do we address these barriers to access? And the answer that we've come up with is to create an inclusive network with independent programs using a train and support model that attacks multiple barriers in a way that allows for cultural relevancy and long-term impact. So it does that because we're training the teachers and youth workers that are working with these kids every day. So here in San Francisco, just to, for an example, uh, there is a neighborhood called The Mission and there are many Spanish-speaking residents, uh, new immigrants in The Mission, and if you're working with kids in The Mission, you need to be able to speak Spanish. And so if we here in the Bay Area are training those teachers and youth workers who speak Spanish and they then take their kids out on a trip, then that whole trip takes place in Spanish. And that makes a huge difference. So 
that's where we feel like we're attacking these multiple barriers and allowing for cultural relevancy and longer term impact because those teachers and youth workers are the ones that return from the trip with the kids back to the after school program, back to the school where those kids are. And then they're there when the kids say, hey, when can we go again? Okay, so that's a little bit again about our theory of change. Now I wanna to move to talking to you a little bit more about the program model. So there's really five core components of the model. Uh, as we see it, these are really, again, addressing barriers. Uh, the first barrier is the outdoor skills and, again, fear. So training is really designed to address those barriers and provide people with the skills and the comfort uh, so that they can take their kids outdoors. If you as an adult aren't comfortable yourself, you're not going to take kids out. Gear, and that, of course, is those gear libraries where we lend outdoor equipment uh, to youth that don't have them and, and empower them to take their kids out. Transportation is a huge challenge. I'll talk about that briefly, as is funding. If you have those first three, uh, but you don't have the money and the kids in your community don't have the money, it's still not going to happen. So sometimes providing funding can make a difference. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about community. Um, and in fact, that's one of the most powerful things that our member organizations can provide. Okay, so the trainings. Um, so there's a number of trainings that are provided that, uh, and they, they really vary. Um, there's three core types of trainings that happen. This isn't all of them, um, but they do really range from uh, the day hiking program, that's for the novice folks that haven't ever taken their kids out, um, maybe away from the field house. They are maybe doing a soccer program with them or tutoring. Um, you know, indoors at a school, but they realize the kids aren't getting out and they want to take them out on day hikes. So our program member in Seattle, the Washington Trails Association, started off their program uh, and led their first trainings as day hike trainings. And this is actually a, an innovation that is spread throughout the network and now other program members are, are doing day hike trainings where they weren't before. Camping trainings are one night trainings that are happening throughout the network. This is the most, uh, this, this is the type of training that happens the most. Uh, this is a group that we trained just last weekend uh, in horrible weather in Chicago. Um, fantastic, amazing group of people. Youth workers from throughout America's third largest city uh, were excited to get out there and camp despite the weather. And then lastly, uh, there's backpacking trainings that happen, and these are, these are really taking it to a deeper level, um, really getting away from vehicles and into the backcountry um, where we're running five-day trainings, uh, five-day, four-night trainings, and really teaching uh, leave no trace and outdoor safety at a different level where you're really in the wilderness. So there's, the last thing I want to mention about trainings is that there's really two most important things uh, that we try to achieve in these trainings. And that's the first is that we want to teach these teachers and youth workers how to use the outdoors as a powerful tool for youth development. So we're really agnostic as to how they use wilderness. Science teachers, of course, are going to use it to teach life sciences, botany, uh, teach about geology. Of course, there's no better way to teach about rocks than to get out on rocks and pick up rocks and find rocks. Um, but that, that um, also might be used to teach um, pro-social behavior. If you're a gang violence prevention officer, if you're working um, with really gang-impacted communities, then you're not likely not going to necessarily be teaching about rocks, um, but you're going to be teaching how to rely on one another and to trust one another. And that's all good. This, we really see wilderness can be used for many different ways. And then the second thing that we talk about is how to keep kids safe, warm, and dry. And this is really based on this belief that, of course, if you keep kids safe, warm, and dry, and they're comfortable in any weather, then they're going to want to go out and do it again. If they get cold, if they're miserable, of course, they don't want to go out and do this again. It's not fun for them. Um, so, of course, the inverse is true. And that's, that's how we uh, teach that and, and talk about the gear and uh, layering and all the rest. Okay, so once people are trained, uh, then they can gain access to the gear libraries. So these are some pictures of uh, a number of different gear libraries. They really do come in a number of different shapes and sizes. Um, they range from 
uh, shipping containers on the left there. Uh, that's a new gear library in Chicago that's run by the Chicago Park District uh, to much larger gear libraries uh, in the Bay Area. The, there's four gear libraries actually, um, or about to be four, the largest of which in Oakland, California can now outfit over 400 kids at a time. Uh, it's in a warehouse, uh, uses about 3,000 square feet of a warehouse. Um, and uh, there's really a number of different things that we provide within these gear libraries. Uh, everything from tents to sleeping bags to all the outerwear, the kitchen kits over there on the upper right hand corner um, that people can check out for uh, so that they can do the, the cooking that they need to do. Uh, one, the photo in the, in the lower right hand corner is one I wanted to mention. When you're thinking about gear libraries, um, you need to think about drying facilities. This has been a big challenge for folks um, to find the space. Uh, if you live in a place where um, you can one, then the drying facilities can be outdoors. Um, this is, a, am sure, the largest drying facility within our network. Um, it's in the Presidio in California, um, and they've been able to set up a place to dry out the tents, um, where it's a challenge because actually lots of fog and cold weather up there. And in the center, you see a baseline library package. These are the numbers that we put forth as uh, kind of the round numbers that we, we would encourage people to start with when they're starting gear libraries. Uh, do they need to have exactly 15 tents or 50 sleeping bags? No, of course not. Um, if you had 35 sleeping bags and 40 sleeping pads um, and you're ready to start uh, leading trainings and checking out gear, go ahead. That's, that's great. Um, we encourage that. Uh, we just throw this number out there because we feel like it's a good number where you can support uh, likely two groups at a time um, and the gear won't be taken by a single group and you allow for more groups to, to take advantage. Okay, the next component uh, is transportation and, and funding. Again, once you have that training and you have that gear, you still need to be able to get um, to that public lands, to that national park or regional park um, this is the toughest nut to crack, and the way in which we deal with transportation is often th through the funding. Um, and some of our member organizations are providing transportation subsidies, and then others are providing mini grants of $250 that can be used for transportation, and some employ a combination of both things. So they'll provide transportation subsidies as well as the mini grants, and that can really make a difference. Uh, sometimes groups, they go through the training, they can gain access to the gear, and they still can't make the trips happen. And then you provide $250, and all of a sudden it can happen. So uh, those are two important pieces that can make a difference. And then lastly, the last component, and again, this is a really powerful and important way um, to support people within your community, is, is to really provide a supportive community of peers where people can learn from one another how to build robust programming and solve problems specific to their school districts, population of clients, or types of bureaucracy. So an example here would be uh, in the Bay Area, we've trained social workers um, and staff from, from, from uh, where they're working with foster kids. So that when you're working with that particular population, you have lots of regulations around um, what you can do with those kids and uh, the member, the staff of the member organizations can't know um, what the regulations are when you're working with so many different populations of kids. So what we can do is we can connect social worker to social worker, science teacher to science teacher, youth workers that are working with young children with other youth workers that are working with young children and they can learn from one another. So lots of different ways that that happens. Um, sometimes it's through Facebook, sometimes it's through a listserv, sometimes it's through in-person um, meetings that happen on site uh, at our member organization sites. And we really build a community where people are sharing their values uh, and learning from one another. And that's a really important way that trips are able to happen is when they can connect to one another and support one another. Sometimes they volunteer on each other's trips. Okay, so that's really about the model. 
Um, Severia, maybe if, they, if we stop and maybe answer a question, if, some, if there are any questions, you, I think you need to take yourself off mute. Yep, I'm here. Um, so a couple of questions for you. Um, let's just see. Uh, can we create... Uh, can we create a gear library for our community with your help without implementing the training mo model? That's a great question. Uh, and the way I'd like to answer it is, is that it's, we're evolving what membership to the network looks like right now, and we're leaning towards a model whereby you can provide gear through a gear library and ideally work towards employing training as well. Um, we haven't made a final decision about this yet, um, but actually this week our advisory council will be talking about just that model. Um, we really feel like it's a best practice to use trainings to allow people to understand how to use the gear um, and to do it safely. Um, so it's an open question, um, and I would say we should talk on the phone, um, whoever asked the question, um, and certainly there are people, there are organizations throughout the country that are utilizing gear libraries. One in specific is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, called the Urban Ecology Center. They have a, a pretty terrific gear library that they loan out equ equipment and they don't run trainings. Um, and we know those folks and we work with those folks. So, uh, so we should talk more about that. All right. Um, there may be more questions about the model, but let's save them for the end and I'll get through the presentation and maybe address some of the questions and then, uh, and then we can go from there. Okay, cool. And then we okay. have one. Um, we have one that's sort of about community. Um, I know you're just talking about that. Do you have? Yeah. Um, and again, and if the, any of these are better, like if you're going to be uh, approaching it later, by all means, feel free just to hold off on it. But the next one is: Do you have any examples of a collaboration or a collaborative group of organizations building and managing a gear library together? I feel there's a lot of folks in my community that would be interested in this, but not sure anyone has the bandwidth to take it on alone. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's an effort underfoot in Portland, Oregon, where there are a number of different organizations involved, and uh, they are uh, they're hopeful that they're that a collaborative can be formed, and there's uh, an organization that's sort of set up as a backbone organization um, that uh, that hopefully can provide some support for this type of collaboration, I think one of the important things for, for everybody to know is that the model is very much uh, affected by or driven by geography, right? Because people need to pick up the gear and they don't want to go too far to get the gear. So in a place like Portland, uh, the folks that I'm working with, I think we've come to feel like two to three, maybe four gear libraries in the end um, will be sufficient to support um, and, you know, to make mission impact there. Um, in a place like Los Angeles, there's going to be eight to ten gear libraries because it's so spread out um, and people just aren't going to drive two hours to go and pick up gear to then have to go to the public lands that they go to. So, yeah, we're definitely open to that. I think it's a harder uh, road to hoe. To The more organizations you have involved, um, the more communications required, um, the more you have to be, you have to build trust and you, you're going to want to share some of the funding, um, but it is possible. So it's a good question. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's move towards the two different pathways to this model. Um, as we have come to understand it. So the first is um, what we call training and gear libraries um, plus public lands. And what that really means is that there are, uh, youth, sorry, there are member programs. Um, this is a picture of uh, the Gear Library uh, when it was in um, one spot in Oakland, California, where we're training people in public lands, uh, whether it's at the regional parks um, that are close by or at Yosemite National Park. And then we're saying, okay, now that you're trained, come back and borrow this equipment and take it wherever you want. And that can be very close by. Um, you know, there are campgrounds actually that we've helped to build in San Francisco where you, you know, literally will go, um, you know, 10 minute drive and within your city and you can set up tents and camp there or you can go very far. So folks have driven from the San Francisco Bay Area five hours down to Death Valley 
um, or, or up to Oregon and further away. And it's really up to the youth worker, uh, to the school, youth serving organization to decide when and where and how those trips happen. So it's very flexible. That's kind of the take home around this type of model and the way that that would work. The other way in which it's coming about, and sometimes these are combined within communities, um, and this is, I'm thinking about um, those folks that are at a land trust now. Um, that's where there's a site-based training and gear library within a campground. So this is a picture of some equipment that uh, is waiting for a school. Uh, there's, this, there's the kids that have arrived um, with the gear waiting in a pile for them. They went through a training at that campground. Uh, this is the camping in the Presidio program. Uh, that Bay Area Wilderness Training helped to make happen in collaboration with a number of other organizations, including the National Parks, which is the land manager um, partner within this program. And so they developed a training where they're training one night overnight training, and then the youth workers and teachers come back to that site. So they're trained on that site, they come back to that site, and all they need to do is get their permission slip signed, get the food, and they come to that campground, and again, all the gear sitting there waiting for them. Um, there's a staff person that welcomes them, gives them an orientation to the site, and then basically hands them the keys, and, and the youth workers and teachers then take over and stay for a night, sometimes two nights, and they're able to make that trip happen. And you can really think about this one as the on-ramp um, for those folks that really need a lot of support, that maybe have never camped before, um, so you're thinking about these trainings as ones that, you know, for many folks, this is the first time they've ever camped. Um, and, and it makes it so that these trips can happen in a very easy way. So if you compare the two models, and again, these can exist in the same community, um, you're looking at one where there's just your libraries, they're not associated with a site, it's very flexible, or one that is site-based um, at a campground. Uh, again, the two examples here would be the Camping at the Presidio program in San Francisco, and then also the Forest Preserve District of Cook County. For those of you in the Midwest, um, you know about um, Cook County in Chicago. Um, this is a land manager, um, sort of like the regional parks, if you will, um, and they uh, just completed construction of five new campgrounds last year, and in one of those campgrounds, we developed a program like this. Um, where we're training youth workers and teachers and they're borrowing equipment at that campground. Okay. Next I want to talk about how to get started. So here you are, uh, you thought about the model, some of you look like it sounds like you're ready to, to begin um, employing a gear library and loaning out equipment to folks. Um, the first thing you need to do is really build that trusted team of folks that are going to do this. Whether that's within your agency um, or that's a multiple agency partnership, um, or whether it's um, some young, ambitious folks that are looking to start this um, brand new within your community, you really have to build that team of folks uh, that are going to advocate for this model and say, hey, how do we do this? How do we go get this done? Um, and, they, and it can happen. Um, there's uh, a young woman um, entrepreneur who got things started in, in Boise, Idaho. Um, and that's how it's happening in Portland, is, is a group of people that um, are working with multiple agencies are, are starting to work together and build momentum towards, towards a program there. So again, uh, the requirements include storage for outdoor gear. Um, sort of obvious, but um, you know, people always, always ask me, so how much space do we need? Um, so an area large enough to accommodate for drying tents and laundry facilities is ideal. Um, a minimum of about 500 square feet would be good. Um, it can happen in a, uh, in, you know, a container, um, shipping container. So you don't need to necessarily um, lease a building, um, but you often do. Um, in Austin, Texas, our member network down there, uh, our, our program, Families in Nature, um, just uses an off-site you know, storage facility where there's, you know, lots of other um, 
storage closets where people are storing their extra stuff, books and furniture, and then Families in Nature stores their equipment there, um, and their gear library is open by appointment only. And it ranges from that all, all the way to, again, the largest gear libraries in the system, um, you know, a couple thousand feet um, of, of space where there's floor-to-ceiling shelves as well as space to set up tents um, and dry them out. Okay, then you need, of course, outdoor gear. Um, this is where Outdoors Empowered Network can provide the highest level of support, um, not only uh, getting discounted gear, but also donating gear uh, and getting it shipped straight from the manufacturers to members, and really just leveraging the relationships that, uh, that we've built over the years. I've been going to Salt Lake City for longer than I'd like to admit, uh, but to the trade show twice a year um, where, we, where I get to talk to my my friends and say, hey, you know, this is where the industry can really make an impact and help us get kids outdoors. The fourth thing, of course, is competent outdoor educators. Um, you're going to want to really tap into uh, folks that have uh, training um, that, you know, is if they have a wilderness first aid, a first responder, or a WEMT certificate, um, as well as significant field experience. Um, those are the folks that are going to be providing the training. Um, that, that then would preclude the access to the gear libraries. So you're going to really want to make sure that those folks are on your staff or you hire folks um, that can provide that. And then last, thing, then last, of course, is you need funding. This is what greases the wheel. Um, ideally, um, multi-year commitments, um, of course, that's hard. But I just really encourage folks to press for that. Um, anytime you're launching a new program, um, you want to allow yourself an opportunity to plan implement and then adjust uh, as you go and make an adjustment to the scale of the program. Um, you know, if you start slow and then you really build um, a pipeline of youth workers, you want room to be able to grow into that um, and add. Um, or you may start, start slow. It depends on when during the year you start as well. Um, and then we can help think about that and when we help, uh, when we help you, you know, with, with your program planning. Think about how much funding you might need to get things going. Um, so those are just a few things that you might need as you get started if you feel like you want to bring the model uh, to your community. And then, of course, lastly, the whole reason for being is so that we can get kids outdoors. Um, many of these kids are, are, again, getting out for the first time. Uh, they're using gear that's going to keep them safe, warm, and dry, um, irregardless of the weather. Um, this is up in the Cascades uh, in Seattle. Um, and uh, again, kids that are going to get out for the very first time in their lives, um, sometimes these kids are seeing snow for the first time, seeing the Milky Way for the first time, and uh, as many of you know, because you're already working with kids, getting them outdoors, um, it just makes a huge difference in their lives. Um, they really can see the world from a new perspective, a new lens, um, and it can just make, of course, all the difference. So um, I want to go ahead and end with that and say Thanks for joining, um, and let's just go ahead and wrap up and um, answer questions that you have, uh, comments, thoughts, and um, thanks again. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so everyone who's on the call, please feel free to um, throw questions in the question box, and we will get to them, um, or we'll try to get to all of them before we end. Uh, there was one that sort of followed up on the last community question, Kyle, and, for, and before we get into questions and nuts and bolts, thank you so much. Um, the work that you do is super inspiring. Um, it's exciting to see that the program is growing and getting into other areas and exciting to see that you took an idea that you were doing and really wanted to make it something bigger. So um, thank you for all the work that you do in doing that. It's very exciting. Oh, yeah. um, so somebody was talking about, um, when we were talking about community, that uh, one of our listeners said that they're facing the same issue within their community, whether or not there's enough capacity within the community to support a library um, and trying to find the right organizations who might be interested and start the conversation. They said they think it's important to start at the beginning. So I think um, you've given some really good sort of tips as to where to start. And I think that actually just might be um, a good question. Like you, co you covered what are the requirements to be a member, but just, I mean, what really would be maybe that first step? For if somebody's on the call and they're really excited about this idea, would it be to contact you and you can help them work through talking about their, you know, what may be available in their community already? Um, what would you consider like the very first step? 
Uh, so let, let me ask another question before I answer it. Can you, is it possible to ask back that person, Severia, um, where they're from? So um, the person... she actually is the one person who said she had to jump off to go to a meeting. <laughs> um, oh. She, she may, Katie, are, are you, raise your hand if you're still on the call. Um, I see that you are. Um, uh, well, okay. so the answer. Uh, so, so I guess, yeah, so I just, I, just I, I wanted it to be more of a general question because I think um, a lot of people probably face that where they, they're just not sure, you know, maybe what's already happening in their community or how to connect with the right people, so. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the, the way I'd like to answer this is, um, you know, certainly you can give me a call. Um, I'm talking to a lot of people around the country that are at very different stages of development. Um, whether they're working, you know, like Bay Area Wilderness Training, they've been around 15, 15 years, um, or up in Seattle, where they're about three years in, um, to, um, you know, Chicago, where they're just getting their programs off the ground. Um, so I would say certainly give me a call, um, shoot me an email, um, but also reach out to the member organizations um, throughout the country that are, that are in your region. So um, throughout the Northeast, um, you should be contacting the Appalachian Mountain Club. Um, they're running programs uh, that are affecting kids and communities from Washington, D.C., all the way up through New England um, and up into Maine, um, running trainings that are accessible to folks in any of those uh, states, um, again, from D.C. on, on north um, along the eastern seaboard. And then um, in those uh, cities that, that um, are represented by the organizations here. So that would be Chicago, Los Angeles, um, the Bay Area, Seattle, Boise, Idaho, and Austin, Texas. Um, and those organizations are listed on our website um, and you can click to their websites and get their contact information um, through, uh, through again, outdoorsempowered.org um, and learn from them um, as well as, of course, we'd love to be able to talk with you about um, the steps that you might want to take to help get this thing off the ground. One thing that I didn't mention that I should also mention is as you start to go and get things rolling, if it becomes clear that um, you're going to be running programs, um, I would say within sort of a 12-month period, one of the things that can be very helpful, and I think you really need to be on track um, to becoming a member, is for you to come to our national summit. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but um, every year we hold a national summit. This year, for the first time, it's going to be outside of the Bay Area. Um, it's going to be hosted by the Forest Preserve District of Cook County in Chicago. And for those uh, folks that are, again, really aggressively pursuing the model and that have employed our support, um, that can be a great place to learn from others and um, really see programs on the ground. Um, that's, that's another thing that I've learned can make a huge difference is to really go to those organizations, see what the gear libraries look like. Um, it seems like it's a simple thing. Oh, well, it's just gear on shelves. You know, you're checking it in and out. But um, to see the scope of the work that's being done um, at a gear library, um, like the one at Bay Area Wilderness Training, for instance, or up in Seattle, where, um, you know, these gear libraries really are significant. And they're utilizing multiple spaces um, as community rooms, as uh, places to do pre-trip meetings, you really can get a sense of the program and how the program needs to be designed in such a way using, again, those five components of services um, that, you know, it can make all the difference to, to make it more tangible, I guess. Very cool. Um, and Katie said she's from the Monterey Salinas area, so it sounds like there are resources in the Bay Area for you, Katie, for sure. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I know Katie. So Katie... Katie's, Katie's on the right track, and she's cool. talking to the right folks already, so, Great. Um, so this is good. Um, and then let me, somebody um, wanted to share the dates for the, the information for the National Summit, so I'm going to put that into the chat so everybody can see. Um, in the meantime, there's a couple more questions, um, and this is from the same person. One, how can an organization like Leave No Trace support the training components that OEM provides for partners and members? And also, um, uh, the person's from Leave No Trace, so they're wondering, it looks like Denver area does not have any current members or programs. Is this correct? So it's a two-fold two question. Yeah, terrific. Okay. 
Um, yeah, let me just go back into the National Summit, just say the dates are the third, uh, the third, the fourth, and then we're likely to have um, uh, an additional event on the 5th of November. Um, so starting um, you know, on Thursday and Friday, November uh, 3rd and 4th, um, and then potentially uh, heading towards the 5th of November in Chicago. And I put the link in the okay, chat box for everybody. Terrific. And then for Leave No Trace, thanks for joining, first of all. Um, uh, your work is an inspiration to all of us, and um, we have been utilizing Leave No Trace um, ethics throughout the network and in our trainings. Um, the training that we just did in Chicago um, was one where, once again, we, uh, we did a little skit to um, act out the seven principles, and we gave out the cards that we had purchased from you. Um, I think, you know, at a national level, this is, there, there is opportunity for us to work together, uh, and I'd love to be in touch to talk about, uh, for instance, Colorado and how to get things happening there. There's lots of great stuff uh, underway there, um, and we've had some inquiries from organizations and communities in Colorado that would like to make this happen, and I think, um, you know, the most important thing for us to do is to just be aware of where, uh, you know, where you guys are um, touching communities and working with folks that um, are, you know, looking to employ Leave No Trace ethics and, um, you know, we can talk about those standards and how, um, you know, we're trying to really build out best practices. Um, you know, we're a relatively new network, um, just over three years in and uh, really trying to be inclusive. So the challenge is that there's lots of diversity within the programs and where they're at and, uh, and how they're um, employing programs within their regions, which are really different from one another. Um, that's been an amazing uh, and interesting challenge for us, as I'm sure it is for Leave No Trace as you think about, you know, how to uh, get people to think about their environments in different climates and, you know, whether it's in Texas or in, uh, you know, the Midwest, it's, they're, they're pretty different. So, yeah, let's just be in touch. Great. Um, there's, is there a more detailed toolkit you can provide? Is there something, a resource on the website or maybe something that people can, to get started? There, we're working on it um, to come up with uh, a more, I would say, um, packaged toolkit for you. I think the most important resources that exist on the site right now are those in the, uh, the member area. If you go to um, our website and look at members, you'll find the existing members, but also how to become a member. And then there's a couple of documents there um, that speak to uh, and, and add further to some of the requirements um, as well as the application. So we've really set up the application to become a member in such a way that it will help, uh, help you to think through how to build a program. Um, so that's, even if you're not ready to apply, I think that's a really important piece and can be used as sort of a proxy for a toolkit for the moment, um, you know, is to download that application and think through, okay, you know, who needs to be on our steering committee? Who needs to, um, you know, be able to be a part of this to provide the different components? Um, if it's not a single organization, what other organizations need to be involved? Um, how will we think about data collection and reporting? Um, how will we think about the space that we need and how that can be um, provided and, uh, and maintained? You know, you really want to think about how we can do this in such a way that, you know, it's not going to, be a program that's going to be just one, uh, you know, just up for one or two seasons, but rather you really want to build ideally um, a program that's going to become an institution and one that will support the entire community. Again, um, you know, the title of the webinar here was really building community capacity, um, and that's something we're really trying to do is, is to build community capacity for the teachers and youth workers in your area so that they can take their kids outdoors. Uh, because once everybody's on board, uh, or as many as those teachers and youth workers as we can get on board, um, then we're starting to approach um, impacting the need that, of course, is so large. Um, you know, there's all there's kids throughout the country that are just not getting outdoors, um, irregardless of whether you have lots of programs doing this, like in the Bay Area, or whether there are very few. We're just really not meeting the need. 
Um, so we're trying to really approach it differently and say, hey, there's schools and youth workers in every community in the United States, and if we can empower them um, and build their capacity, then they can get this done. Um, so on that note, uh, this sort of relates to like how far that model goes. So the question is, are there models of gear libraries where families or groups of families can get trained and check out gear without being associated with a school or organization? Yes, is the answer. Um, so families in nature, uh, if you're looking at that last slide, um, their logo is in the far right hand corner, um, is in Austin, Texas. And they are working with majority families. Uh, they um, are sometimes families within a single school, um, and they're, uh, they're sometimes families that are associated with what are called family nature clubs. Um, but these are, uh, you know, parents generally um, that are leading other groups of parents um, to take their kids out on trips, um, and sometimes those kids are very young, and. So these, uh, these groups are forming networks and then linking in with the gear libraries um, and getting kids outdoors. So this is, a new pro this is our newest program member, actually. Um, and again, they're in Austin, Texas. Um, they're very linked in with the uh, Children in the Nature Network and the um, Family Nature Clubs. Um, so if you want to check out uh, the Children in Nature ne Network and their Family Nature Clubs, uh, they, that, that's, a good, that's a good resource for the, those of you working with families. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so I just want to make sure, um, I know people are sending in questions and sort of chat kind of stuff through the questions. I believe that not everybody can see the questions when they're um, put into the question box. But in the chat, I believe that people can see in the um, their chat box. So if you can see the chat box in your control panel, I've been trying to kind of put information there that's more general. Also, a couple of people, if you had had more conversational comments, um, please, you can um, go ahead and put the chat messages in there as well. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys can see that. If not, um, I can send the information from um, in the follow up email after this. So I will add um, information here. I'm just looking through questions. There's some sort of like nuts and bolts questions, Kyle. You know, who's responsible for drying the equipment? What happens if something breaks? Um, I think those are sort of nuts and bolts, but probably easy to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. This is this is great, and and I would say it's those types of questions that um, that we're dealing with all the time. Little little problems that can become big problems when you're dealing with as much gear as. Our, uh, our organizations are dealing with. Um, you know, it really really starts with that you need to have staff that are going to be um, managing the equipment. Um, in the smallest organizations, you might have a single person that is both running the trainings um, as well as uh, providing the gear, you know, pulling it, staging it for when somebody has requested the gear, and then, uh, and then loaning it out and going through the checklist, making sure that Everything that you know is uh, being requested is actually checked out, and there's often changes between you know what somebody initially requests with what actually goes out the door, and then of course on the other end making sure that it, it gets checked back in. Um, and then in the larger organizations, you know they have multiple people um, that are working to keep the gear library open, you know five days a week. Sometimes uh, you know there's even checkouts that are available in the evening because there's such high demand um, when a program's been around for a long time. Um, and then with regards to, you know, what do you do when the gear is broken? So, you know, the, these are all small businesses. I, I really encourage everybody in the nonprofit sector to think about the fact that we are running businesses and thank goodness um, and lucky for us, our business gets to be getting kids outdoors. Um, so we love our business and what we do, um, but you still have to, of course, uh, you know, make the numbers work, and you can't just let stuff break and not be able to financially, uh, you know, have the money to replace that equipment. So we charge people um, when they come back and they've broken something, um, and it's clear that uh, that they that it broke because a kid was, um, you know, being a knucklehead. Uh, then it's on them. Or if they lose gear, that's more often the case um, that it's lost than that it's um, broken. 
Um, you know, wear and tear does happen, so it's really up to the discretion of the staff. Um, you know, and a, and a lot of stuff do, does just wear out because it's being used, um, you know, as I mentioned, over 300 days out of the year. When gear gets used that often, it wears out quickly. Um, so it's not always that we charge folks, but if, you know, somebody, you know, ruins it because they tag it with a big magic marker, um, then we charge them, or if they lose it, um, then we charge them, and that money goes to help, uh, you know, replace the gear. Fantastic. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, I'm just looking through um, the questions. That seems to be the bulk of the questions. Um, there was a couple of Colorado people who are excited to meet each other. I'll connect you guys after the webinar. <laughs> um, or, oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Um, like I said, or if you can, um, I think, can um, raise your hand if you can see everybody else's questions. So I'm I think when questions are submitted, I'm not sure if they're private or not. All right, um, looks like no hands raised. Um, raise your hand if um, you can see the chat box where I put the links in for everybody. Okay, great. Um, and I believe that you guys also can type messages in that chat box. So if there's, if you wanna like share your information with another member, um, you can do that as well um, into the chat box. And like I said, for the Colorado uh, people, I can, I'm happy to connect you guys after the webinar. Um, the other thing that I would, of course, like to mention is that TYO is a great place to connect with other people. Um, if you have not become a member of TYO yet, um, I highly recommend doing so because it's easy to find people based on location. If you fill out your profile and say that you're from Colorado, um, then it's really easy to find other people from Colorado. Uh, we are starting a new base camp um, gathering, which is one of our functions for TYO that we'll be, um, that we'll be uh, using to communicate with each other. So um, I will put, you know, that's where the, the webinar will be posted and stuff like that. So um, there are more places on TYO to connect with each other and to start collaborating and trying to find partners in crime <laughs> to do this and make it happen. Um, let's see what else. And also, um, and then just so you guys know too on uh, TYO, Empower, Outdoors Empowered Network, Kyle has a gathering for his members specifically. So if you see it on there, it is a closed gathering because it's meant for members of Outdoors Empowered Network um, so that they communicate with each other. So that's just another resource that they that um, TYO and OEN provide for you in that they once you're part of that community, you really are part of a greater community and able to learn from each other. So lots of opportunities. Um, and on that note, it is 11 o'clock and Kyle, I would like to thank you again. If you have any, is there any sort of last, last words, last thoughts you'd like to share before we sign off? Um, just, just mostly just thank you, Severia and, uh, for all of the folks over there at TYO at Chris, uh, and, and everybody out there doing such great work. Um, I really do um, believe so strongly in this model, but I also want to just, just put it out and make it very clear that it's not um, the silver bullet. We all need to do the work that we're doing. Um, it's all complementing one, you know, it's all complementing complementary work. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to empower uh, this larger community and, um, and we're, you know, very broad in how we think about this, but we also need you all out there doing the specific stuff that you do, um, teaching ecology, teaching about climate change, providing uh, the land for those of you that are land managers, um, you know, providing YMCAs that are doing multiple types of programming, just engaging kids. So, um, you know, onward, let's just keep getting kids outdoors. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. And you guys will all be receiving, um, if you sign up for the webinar, a uh, follow up tomorrow that will include a recording of this webinar that you can share with other people. So um, just uh, in case you want to go back and reference it, uh, we will share that after and then uh, you'll be able to find it on TYO as well. So thank you guys all for joining us and you can reach out to me anytime as well if you have any questions. Have a great day. Bye-bye.